I'd like to start by saying a special good morning to everybody who is attending this service on Zoom. I hope you can hear, I hope you can see, I hope you are fulfilled by the worship that you receive this morning. And to everybody here in person, good morning and welcome to our worship. Thank you for inviting me and Roger here today. It's good to be conducting an in-person service once again, even if we are still restricted in what we choose to do. We are, we hope, making progress. We're in a period of transition at present. We feel that we should by now have beaten the virus, but we are aware that the Delta variant strain still has quite a tight hold, and this is keeping the figures high. It's difficult for us to make our own decisions about what it's best to do, but if we behave as common sense dictates and act responsibly, we should move in the right direction. We can only hope and pray that that will be enough. As its president, I bring greetings and warm wishes from the General Assembly of Unitarian and Free Christian Churches to the Congregation of Newcastle Unitarian Church. I also offer greetings from my own congregation in Bury, Greater Manchester, and from churches that I have recently visited Rochdale, Kendall, Wormsley Bolton, Blackpool, and Ansel, which lies to the south of Blackpool. I was booked to conduct a service at Ansel on the last Sunday in March 2020, and I arrived there finally at the end of June 2021, only 15 months late. Ansdell asked particularly that I should give their greetings to other congregations I visited. They have not had a visit in living memory from a serving GA president or vice president until I arrived. They seemed to welcome my visit. They made me very welcome. And I've been invited to pay a return visit, which I shall do just before Christmas. And I mention this not out of personal vanity, but rather to show the importance of the presidential visit as an event which offers support and encouragement to a particular church group and raises morale. I also wish Newcastle Unitarian success as you embark upon a new chapter of your church life. Once you are able to refurbish your somewhat smaller premises and are no longer responsible for the general maintenance of a large building, you can begin to consider your most important priorities and your way forward into the future. So this is, for you, a great opportunity, even though it has been subject to some delays. Good luck over the next few months. I shall look forward to hearing good news very soon. And now I'm going to light the chalice candle and say the chalice words. I believe in faith, in worshipping as conscience and integrity dictate. I believe in freedom to choose and follow a path through life to the benefit of all people. I believe in hope that whatever may befall us, all shall in time be well. I believe in happiness, which comes from a life well lived, in which self fulfillment truly matters. I believe in peace within our souls, in our country, and throughout the world. I believe in love, in hearts, deeds, and words. May love, all encircling and eternal, bring harmony and unity to us all. May we not fall into panic and hysteria. May unwarranted self-concern not blind us to the needs of others or lead us into irresponsibility and the undermining of community. May we have a deep and active concern for those in hardship and real danger and not inflate our own lesser worries into unreal terrors. 
May we be conscious that fear can be the greatest sickness infecting our minds and spirits, paralyzing our daily lives, and bringing chaos to the economies and networks on which they depend. May our prayer be for reason and good sense, that we may face the crisis with sound knowledge and clear sight, and may our hearts be warm and strengthened with the love that drives out fear. This is our prayer and our resolve. Amen. This morning's first reading is a retelling of an old Chinese story and it's recorded by the Reverend Joy Croft, who is now a retired Unitarian minister. And the story is called A Trouble Shared. There is a story told in China of a woman whose only child fell ill and despite her tireless nursing, died, grief-stricken, clutching the poor dead thing to her breast. She sought out the wise woman of the village. Please bring my baby back to life. I'll give you anything, do anything. Of course, replied the old woman, nothing simpler. Only you must bring me one vital ingredient for the spell. Just one grain of rice. But it must come from a house that has never, never known sorrow. The bereft mother roamed the world over. She imagined her task would be easy. The world seemed such a bright and careless place against her own forlorn darkness. Knocking on door after door, however, she learned that there was no house in all the wide world, no family, no human heart, which had not at some time suffered loss and experienced sorrow. So she never found her miracle grain of rice. But I like to think, although the old tale does not say so, that on every doorstep she gave gifts of comfort and sometimes of hope from those she met there who themselves had loved and lost. In time, I imagine, she was able to give these gifts as well as to receive them. I like to think that although her beloved child never came back to her, she was never again so alone, finding herself linked by sure bonds of deep sympathy to all who, like her, have had the courage to risk themselves in love. Our second reading this morning is a piece from a new book by the Reverend Cliff Reed, Beyond Darkness. The piece itself is called Colours of the Rainbow. And I've chosen this partly because we've begun to use the rainbow as a symbol of our diversity. And more recently, of course, we've used it to symbolise the NHS and the valuable work that has been carried out over the last 17 months. And it's called Colours of the Rainbow. Rainbows have become our symbols of hope, our defiance of the pestilence that spreads fear, ruin and death around our world. What can be the meanings of the, these seven colours? The meanings we could give them as a prayer, as an affirmation of the life we cherish. Let red be for the courage and devotion of those who risk their lives to protect and heal us. Let orange be for the warmth of their compassion, for the inner flame that fires their resolution. Yet let yellow be for the exultant spirit in all loving hearts, shining and defeated like the golden sun. Let green be for the earth, for resurgent nature, for the springtime beauty that refreshes our weariness. Let blue be for transcendence, for the overarching sky that lifts us up when we are weighed down. 
Let indigo be for quietness and reflection, for the soul's rest and restoration. Let violet be for our mourning and our grief, the beauty that is loving the soul. The rainbow can encompass all our moods, all our colours, all shades of our glorious diversity. And may it stand for the assurance that all will be well. And now we enter into a time again of prayer and meditation. Let us remind ourselves of the value of sitting down quietly at some time each day or at least once a week in church to allow distractions to disappear, to refuse busy thoughts and to listen for the still small voice which speaks below the busy world. In this process, may we find the real foundation for action and discover solace and direction in the quiet center within each of us. Spirit of life, release us from the constant need to respond to questions and from the speed with which our lives proceed. Permit us to pause temporarily, to enjoy uninterrupted quietness. Spirit of silence, shut the door of the busy world and let peace surround us. Lead us to an open plain so that our souls can expand to be at one with the earth and the universe as far as the infinite horizon. Spirit of stillness, give us time as a solitude. Enable us to receive and nurture seeds of calmness and thus enrich the quality of our lives. And let us now ponder these thoughts for a few quiet moments. Let us find today and every day quietness and tranquility. Amen. And the last of today's three readings <clears throat> is one which has been adapted from Harry B. Brown's writings, The Prophet, by the Reverend Lindy Laban. It's called Moments of Joy. Perhaps one of the most difficult things that we have to do during our everyday lives in this troubled and demanding world is to discover how to embrace and experience moments of joy as they are offered to us. Is it possible for them not to be dimmed through our awareness of the pain and demands of others, which can also include the feeling of guilt at our good fortune in the face of their difficulties? I believe that we can do this without denying the suffering of others or turning our backs on their needs or indeed by just leaving them temporarily on the back burner whilst we delight in our own joy. For me, it is about learning to hold them together so that by being alive to our own wonders and delights, this feeling can flow out to individuals and the world in a way that is both healing and enriching. Equally as important, during the times when we are feeling overwhelmed and crushed by our own personal situations, is to find a way amongst the chaos to let those glimpses of joy move in. This is not to remove the pain, but to remind us of who we really are and give us the confidence that this too will pass. In the words of Cameron Gibran, talking about joy and sorrow. But I say unto you, they are inseparable. Together they come, and when one sits alone with you at your board, remember that the other is asleep upon your bed.
not to let us go with reference to light at the end of the tunnel as regards the pandemic. I received an email from a friend who told me what she had missed during our prolonged period of lockdown and self-isolation. This was not a long list of complaints, but a realistic assessment of what had been happening to most of us. Towards the top of her list, and mine, came regret of not being able to go to the hairdressers, of being unable to book appointments once such businesses reopened. This practical response to curbing infection and preserving hygiene affected so many of us. If the politicians had deliberately tried to punish us all, they couldn't have devised a better way. Later, my friend sent me her before and after photographs. In the first, she looked miserable. Her hair was over long and drab looking. But in the second, she had become glamorous with a new short style which complemented her looks and a blonde rinse which brought out her skin tones. What a boost to morale and a tribute to the miracle of hairdressing. By now, I think we all understand that recovery from COVID-19 will probably take months, if not years, as there are so many aspects to be assessed and corrected, some of which may not even have occurred to us yet. Boris Johnson has recently stated that we may have to learn to live with the virus, and this might be accurate. Aided by vaccines and booster jabs, we now need to build up our immunity. Annual COVID jabs, like annual flu jabs, could become the norm, especially for higher age groups. There are, of course, many matters which need great care and thought as adjustments are sought. Our economy is already showing signs of being in dire straits. Businesses have closed, never to reopen, with subsequent job losses. For those who are unemployed, money is in short supply. Individuals or families may need to claim state benefits, and our social security system was severely overburdened well before the pandemic began. I have no doubt, as a former money advice worker, that many people will be badly in debt, having used debit and credit cards excessively, which they are now unable to pay off. And depending on the seriousness of their indebtedness, this could affect them for the rest of their lives. The National Health Service, which has responded so bravely and brilliantly to the demands of the virus, is otherwise in chaos. With so many appointments postponed that it's difficult to imagine how this particular logistical and practical problem will ever resolve itself. Our young people have been deprived of their education at all levels, and inevitably standards will be slipped. In addition, many pupils have lost their instincts for discipline, socialisation and independence whilst they have been homeschooled. With the best will in the world, not all home environments are ideal for this purpose, and not all parents are capable of producing quality tuition. For older students, if they complete their education, there is no guarantee that suitable work will be available once their training finishes. The security of the fabric of our lives has been attacked and diminished, and we are well aware that such sectors as music, theatre, the arts, sport, and charitable organisations are also suffering, as their income falls and activities are severely curtailed. Our church life, too, has suffered, since we have been unable to meet together, either not at all, or limited by restrictions, which we still linger. The complaint I hear most frequently from my congregation 
is that they really want to see things properly. Yet we are still reluctant to take this final step until infection rates fall away completely. During closures, and there are still churches which remain shut as they have been since lockdown last year, those of us who have been fortunate with our technology have shared worship and other events on Zoom. For me, this has never been ideal, as it cannot truly replace personal contact, but it has enabled us to keep in touch the best we could do, and better than nothing at all. However, we have to acknowledge that the gap has opened up between those who can and do use Zoom and those who choose not to for whatever reasons. And having acknowledged a potential problem, we need to find a remedy. I think our churches have risen to the occasion magnificently in their efforts to keep in touch in as many ways as possible with emails, letters, phone calls, extra newsletters, leave at home services. The list is long and full of inventiveness and creativity so that caring and concern continue alongside communication. Despite deprivations, our faith has been nurtured and we have continued our efforts to practice the ideals by which we, as Unitarians, aim to live. We are now faced with the task of reassessing the present and future of our congregational lives, which will not be easy, but is essential. One of the major concerns we've all faced since the virus first entered our lives is that of being separated from our families and friends. Our social instincts have had to be suppressed, whilst we have been obliged to self-isolate. Some of us, and I count myself lucky in this respect, have been able to maintain a much reduced contact based on what has been permitted at different times. Going for walks, entertaining small numbers of relatives and friends in our gardens, or occasionally in our homes, or meeting in restaurants and bars. We have had to stay flexible adapting to circumstances as regulations have changed frequently and at short notice. But others have been worse affected. The elderly living alone, who lack nearest and dearest, or whose closest family near to distance. Close friends who are also separated by distance and area. Parents and children who live in totally different countries and still have little prospect of spending real time together. A friend of mine, an American who lives and works here permanently, is desperate to visit her mother, age 82, whom she has not seen for two years. This is not a question of having a holiday, a break, or a change of scene, but a deep-seated need to spend precious time with her closest relative. So far, she has had four consecutive flights cancelled for lack of passengers, and each time has had to face contact with her mother to explain yet again why she can't visit. Our news bulletins tell us that mental health issues are increasing nowadays, and sometimes it is difficult to maintain contact even with neighbours or acquaintances. My regret, personally, is that the freedom I used to have to shop where and when I wished to eat out or to attend concerts in the theatre, for example, has been denied to me for so long, and even now can't be indulged in if I don't feel safe. And in addition, I feel that time and opportunities are slipping away, irretrievably lost, and unable ever to be recaptured. But let's redress the balance and adjust the perspective. Despite what we've missed, there is so much that we've experienced and learned that we've gained rather than lost. 
we've realised the advantages of appreciating what is available to us instead of mourning what is not. If we cannot meet others in our homes or gardens, we have at times been able to take walks with small numbers of people or meet outside for meals or drinks. We have made the best of situations and in the process become more adaptable, more flexible. We have considered aspects of our lives and found that slight alterations to what we used to do and what we prefer to do are possible and lead to improvements. I have always enjoyed going to concerts at the Bridgewater Hall in Manchester. I've especially enjoyed performances given by an organist called Jonathan Scott, a local lad and an international musician. Over the last year and a half, whilst concert halls have been closed, Jonathan has live streamed concerts at least once a month in his home and various other venues. These have then transferred to YouTube to be appreciated for free by thousands of listeners. Jonathan's brother Tom, himself no mean performer, has filmed each concert as well as contributed musical items. You will probably be aware of people in your area who would use lockdown for innovation and experiment. Restaurants which have offered takeaway food. Traditional Sunday lunches, for example, for those who were missing such treats. Food which was delivered instead of being served on the premises. For one of our local meetings last December offered a complete Christmas dinner delivered the day before, which just needed to be repeated and needed. And who could fail to have been inspired by Captain Tom last year? as he completed laps of his garden before his 100th birthday in order to raise money for the NHS. Not only did he succeed brilliantly by raising the 33 million pounds, but he encouraged others to emulate him to the benefit of worthwhile organisations throughout the country. Very often, all that was needed was a basic idea, a little thought, and the energy and the imagination to carry through the deed. We must all have realised that a much simpler lifestyle was being imposed upon us during our time of pandemic. We stayed at home, working there if necessary, and we kept journeys outside our homes to a minimum. How did we react? Did we try to equate this simplicity with a better lifestyle? The opportunity to find the true core of our lives. Some people claim that their lives have been enriched, that their faith and spirituality have deepened. They have created time in which to sit quietly, pondering, reflecting, drawing conclusions, making decisions about the essence of present and future alike. And chances have been on offer for us through seminars and courses through meditation sessions and engagement groups to learn more about helpful techniques to support and sustain us. Hopefully, as we emerge from self-isolation, we will feel better equipped with whatever lies ahead. This seemingly never-ending period has brought greater appreciation of our freedom after being deprived of it. We may feel more positive about pursuing what we most value in life, whether this involves qualities such as kindness and friendship, or more practical needs. We may be more appreciative of our families, of all key workers, of our homes and gardens, of our health, and of our sense of security. What I have valued most has been the time I have been able to spend walking around my neighbourhood. At first, the purpose of this was to provide fresh air and exercise and a chance to clear my mind. But after a while, I came to realise that I was enjoying the chance to explore in detail, finding paths and tracks hitherto unknown, experimenting with different routes, and discovering the history of my local area in the process. I noticed the weather too, 
detecting that it tends to stabilise in my area at about 3 pm. I became aware of wildlife, squirrels, and things about, the occasional deer darting through the trees, the Canada geese, swans, and mallards swimming on a nearby lake and the pleasure of watching the sunlight reflect across the lake shimmering surface at different times of the day, in changing seasons and weather. And although it hardly compensated for our separation from family, whilst out walking, we met a variety of people, previously strangers, who became acquaintances rather than friends. And we exchanged greetings with them, all of few words, or had the occasional long attack, or at a distance, of course. And this was a reminder that humanity is still existing in our narrow world, that personal contact is not lost, and that it will be possible to become social animals once more. It certainly saved my serenity, as well as my sanity. I end, as I began, on the subject of hair. One of our church members decided to shave her head, not because of the hairdresser's prolonged closure or to economise, but in order to sponsor much needed wells in Africa. She set herself a modest target, greatly exceeded, and has raised over £2,000, more than enough to provide 22 wells. She has just finished ministry training and for her ordination, shaved her head again to symbolize the new beginning of her life's work. We may all be facing new beginnings if we have changed from who we were when the pandemic began, although it may take us time to assess how ultimate we are. Let us pray that as we emerge into our new future, we can remember how we felt at first and use this memory together with our newly found knowledge to shape our lives as we come to terms with a changed society. Let us determine what is best for us, how best to achieve what we have planned and aim positively for a successful transformation. Amen. Now, closing words. May the beauty of nature awaken a sense of the eternal, and the goodwill of people inspire a belief in the essential goodness of humankind. We give thanks for the joys we experience and the privileged life we lead in our small portion of this world. We give thanks for the wonders of nature for the beauty of the countryside, for the variety of the changing seasons, and for the blessing of good neighbours. Let us be inspired to live better lives, to serve our fellow human beings to the best of our abilities, and to remember always those who are less fortunate than ourselves, and lend them our aid. Amen.